a panel discussion this afternoon, this afternoon being uh, November 20th of the year 2001. Uh, and uh, uh, with me today is... I'm Miriam Orenstein. Larry Orenstein. Uh, Bumi Knaz. Danny Tuchman. Sid Bernstein. Esther Weingrad. Paul Melrude. Herman Weingrad. Dorothy Weingrad. What we want to start with uh, when we uh, get into the topic is, first of all, the very basis of what we're talking about. Uh, the topic is labor Zionism, but let's start out with what is Zionism? Anybody want to just start with that? Zionism was a movement <coughs> to establish a Jewish national home in Israel. And it began about when? Well, the first Congress, I think, was in 1897. And, and, and when we talk about labor Zionism, what are we talking about then? Well, you see, we have Zionism as a general movement to establish the, the, the state of Israel, but what about labor Zionism? Labor Zionism wanted to establish uh, in Israel a uh, Jewish state that would uh, be uh, socialist, uh, cooperative, and uh, would uh, bring the Jews back to the land. So they would not all be business people, but it would be workers and uh, uh, farmers. How does it differ from the other kind of Zionism that we know of, like general Zionists, the revisionists, the Mizrahi? How does that differ? Anybody? Well, I think it's uh, much earlier than any of the others. Uh, perhaps maybe the next were the Mizrahi, who thought that it should be a religious state. I don't think the general Zionists came for quite a while after that. Yeah, there were social interest groups that de decided the kind of state that they would like to have and the system under which they wanted to live. So it worked out uh, that labor Zion was a very popular uh, group amongst the Zionists. It was uh, also very important. Uh, because of the fact that uh, land had to be reclaimed and uh, places have to be uh, uh, actually uh, uh, made from uh, desert into uh, something that bloomed and swamps had to be uh, drained and this could best be done on a cooperative basis uh, by people who are willing to really extend themselves uh, both mm -hmm. as individuals and as groups in the form of a kibbutz movement which was really the the bottom line of labor Zionism originally. And we used to talk about that time about a, a triangle, and it would be an upside down triangle. Normally, Jews lived where uh, very few people were labor people, and then it got up to uh, the people that were in business, and they were the uh, manufacturers, and, and they're the business people. But here we did it in another way, in that the people that were on the land, the broad base of the people in Israel were land uh, workers, and then smaller and smaller to where it came up to a point where the businessmen were the point rather than the way it was in the other part of the world. Yeah. I'm just going to say the general Zionists believed in a capitalist society. Uh, they believed in Israel being the home of the Jewish people, but not necessarily a socialist society, not necessarily a kibbutz society, but a society that deals with capitalist theories. The interesting thing is, is that on paper it sounded fine, but it actually almost died before it even got started. I mean, kibbutzim were closing up left and right in the early part of the century in Israel, Palestine at the time, and uh, it took many, many years before you really got a basis of people to work on a kibbutz and make it go and make it really for themselves to live and eat whatever they were growing at that particular time. Gee, Lacey, I didn't know that. Oh, see, I, <laughs> 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 the kibbutz moved Street. <laughs> until recently. Well, I really didn't grow that much at any given time, but it grew and they were wealthy unto themselves. They really were. Well, it was more than kibbutzim, though. It was also the histadrut, wasn't it? Yes. <coughs> Those were the arbors well, of the came workers. Later. That came later. That came much later. Okay. I mean, the fact that uh, when, the state was, when the state was established, uh, the uh, first uh, prime minister was Ben Gurion, who was probably one of the foremost labor Zionists in our labor Zionist history. And he certainly was a, a, a leader 
that uh, the rest of the country as well as the rest of the world respected. More than anything else, not only was he a labor Zionist, but he was a Jew. And uh, this was most important to all people because he, he was a uh, Talmud Chochem, he knew the Tanakh, uh, and, uh, and he knew the reason uh, for having a Jewish state made of Jews. And this was his whole uh, emphasis as far as uh, uh, the early years of, of the establishment of the state. One of the guiding principles was that of labor Zionism was that this, this transformation of Israel into a state would have to be done by the Jews themselves, and others couldn't be done by hiring other people to do it for you. This brings the idea of how difficult it was in the early 1920s. As a matter of fact, the time that Golda Meir left Milwaukee in 1921 and went to Israel, those were the years where they took rocks off of the field in order to make them uh, uh, bear fruit. And uh, there were rocks, there were swamps, and they cleared all of it. It was very, very tough going for people of that aliyah that went there when Golda went there after she left Milwaukee. Well, don't forget our philosophers, the people that we respected, had, were more or less framing it out for us vocally and in writing so that we knew what to follow, who to follow, and what they were doing, and they were living examples of, of all of this. Olive Dollard Garden, and so on. Do you call them practical visionaries? Because they, they had in mind what they wanted, mm -hmm. but in advance, I mean, it, it was hard going. Yeah, it was hard going, but at least that was, they formulated the path. And um, like you said, Barrow Katz Nelson and so on, they also were trying to define, are the Jews a nation and all these other things? And of course, uh, it's evolved into that. Well, we talked about those early times in Goldie leaving Milwaukee. Your, Diney, your family was involved with Goldie at that time. What, what do you remember about that? Well, that's uh, just an incidental thing, really. It has nothing to do with the major story uh, that we're trying to uh, discuss. She was a uh, uh, college student first in Milwaukee, uh, at the Milwaukee... Uh, yes, she uh, went to Milwaukee, you know, Milwaukee State Teachers. State Teachers College. Two, she graduated from a two-year class. They didn't have a four-year class. <laughs> and uh, she was involved in the, in the, uh, uh, the uh, Folks Institute and uh, the Shula. Uh, she was a teacher. Um, at the Shula in, in Yiddish. Uh, of course, my uh, father and Herman's father uh, and Peter Ottenstein and many of the early people, uh, uh, Jack Knaz, uh, these were early people in the movement and uh, they knew her uh, when she was uh, uh, a young girl uh, and probably were, all of them were instrumental in uh, having her focus her whole life on, uh, on Jews and on Zionism and on the uh, chances to have a state in Israel. Um, you know, that's, that's really the, the thing that she uh, saw uh, relative to her stay in Milwaukee uh, were the people that influenced her. Kind of strange that uh, she didn't influence them. Uh, you know, because none of these people ended up by making Aliyah and going to Israel with her. She went on her own. Well, let's kind of segue into that, because you talked about your background, Dainey. How did, how, did how did you become labor Zionist? Born. What? Born. Born, what to, born to my <coughs> the right parents. All right, so your parents were involved. Why don't you, why don't you talk about that in terms of the involvement of oh. your parents and how you, and how you became labor Zionist well, in the kind of society or group or chevra yeah. that, you know, that there was here. There was no chevra. You went where your parents went because there were no babysitters in those days. <laughs> so what happened was on Friday night, you went to the folk show because they had an onig every Friday night, and they ate cut off less potatoes, mm -hmm. and you ran around like a nut. And because you were four or five, you didn't understand what they were talking about anyways, and they were singing Jewish songs, which his father led for years and years, and we were, that's how we learned the songs. We learned it only because we heard it every Friday night, but we didn't know what we were singing, but we sang. 
But the interesting thing is, even though we were born into these families, we continued with that philosophy yeah. when we got older. But we didn't and, do it with uh, our kids. And I beg your pardon? We didn't do it with our kids. Oh, you, no, I'm talking about ourselves. You, you follow in your father's footsteps, and I follow in my father's footsteps. Yeah. And I didn't resist it, and I didn't uh, uh, change my way of thinking, and I grew up that way. Well, that's fine and good. I'm not arguing about that because we all did the same thing. It was a carbon copy, no matter what family you're talking about sitting around the table here, that you did it. You did it because you played basketball on a Saturday afternoon. I mean, don't tell that to the rabbis in town, but you played basketball Saturday afternoon, and you went to meetings two and three times a week because there were always meetings, and you had a place where to meet. What meetings are you talking about? Meetings from Hanunim. Okay, that's what I want. Oh, you to know. wanted to know? Yeah. It wasn't the Boy Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody here went to Volkshula that's right. five days a week. I mean, you know, our school day started at... What, seven or eight in the morning and went till eight o'clock at night, right. you know, and uh, after school we went to, to the Pope show. We had Sunday morning. And, uh, the labor Zionist movement uh, in Milwaukee, for example, and I'm sure in other cities, it, it was really a community. It was not just a series of meetings or an or organization. It was a community. These people were talking about our parents. We were very close. They were, they were all close friends. They all helped each other out in many ways financially and other ways. There was, it wasn't just, you know, there was a, they operated a, a school. The Yiddish of Folk Show. Credit Union. Yeah, Credit Union. <laughs> I mean, a lot of these things, I mean, it. it the Farban. And, and they had a Farban, which was an insurance organization, basically. Fraternal, Fraternal. organization. Uh, so it, it was much more than just, a, uh, just an organization. It didn't encompass their whole life, really. I mean, they they lived it uh, seven days a week. I mean, they were they were there Sunday morning at with, to see how the school was running, and they were there during the week and so on. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned all these fraternal organizations and political organizations around the Folkschule. Do you realize that the Farband uh, group, uh, Max Nardo branch, was established in 1905? I don't know where they went back that far, but I remember that red banner that was on the stage at the folk show, and it said Jewish National Workers Alliance, Max Nardo branch, organized 1905. That's unusual. I don't know who those people were. Early on, I think it, it uh, is also interesting that the entire group uh, politically was a little bit left of center. Uh, they read the Milwaukee Leader, which at that time was a socialist uh, newspaper. They voted for uh, Dan Hone and Max Raskin, who were uh, a socialist uh, uh, mayor and, and uh, city attorney. Uh, we marched in the May Day parades uh, at that time uh, because uh, uh, everybody uh, was a little bit left of center, and so there was a political uh, uh, tendency locally as well as our relationship with labor zionism there was also a, a relationship with with labor uh in the city of milwaukee i think this eventually disappeared as uh, all these people became more capitalistic but uh, at least uh, uh, i remember myself walking in a labor day uh, uh parade with uh with uh, paul's father uh, uh carrying a flag what color was it? I forgot. <laughs> Red. I, I, I remember uh, distributing leaflets for my mother to stuff mailboxes for, to, uh, for Norman Thomas, who was running for president oh, yeah. God knows how many times. And uh, I was chased by a janitor. Uh, you dirty communist, he yelled at me. And uh, ch running down the street, dragging the little bag that I had full of... Uh, Announcements. Actually, actually, it made it easy for us because the city was socialistic. I mean, really, yeah. they had thousands and thousands of people that came on May Day and watched us march up. It was Kilburn Avenue. We yeah. had to march up to the auditorium, I think. At one yeah. time, there, besides the city attorney, Max Raskin, yeah. and mayor, there were about six yeah. or seven aldermen. There was Carl Dietz. Oh, sure. Uh, there was a guy. Uh, uh, you had a congressman, Ben Mr. Berger. He, yeah, Mr. Berger. Berger. But he, he's known for something else. He was the only one that voted against going into World War I, I think. Yeah, right. yeah, he was a fine guy. was getting close to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's why we have such a progressive city now as a legacy oh, yeah. of all those years of uh, uh, socialist tendencies. Well, we also knew some of the songs because when you talk about 
uh, uh, going under the red banner, we used to know the uh, the international in Hebrew. That was the Kinder International. Mizan and Kinder Ale Blacha. And then I can recall uh, that we also sang some of the songs of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Um, the four insurgent yeah, generals. We didn't know you didn't about do that. No, no, no. I was younger than that. The Abraham Lincoln Brigade was the latter part of the 1930s. You guys, 1939 was the Spanish yeah. War. Well, 37, 38. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, we uh, <coughs> in integrated Hebrew very early, mm -hmm. and uh, the Arbitering really was the Yiddishists in Milwaukee, oh, not yes. us, yeah, because we. Chicago. But your we, father taught us probably 90% Jewish songs. Well, and we know songs and huh? Hebrew songs. We had, I don't remember, a lot we knew a lot of Yiddish songs. Yes, there were a lot of Yiddish songs. We still sing them. Yes, we do. Pesach. <laughs> Pesach. Pesach. No, in no, terms no. of Milwaukee, <laughs> in, terms of the way, in terms of the way it was in Milwaukee, though, how, how big was this labor Zionist movement uh, in relation to, let's say, the other parts, <laughs> in, relation, in relation to the other parts of the, of the Milwaukee Jewish community? And how do we relate, let's say, to the to the Jews that's of the reform of uh, of the reform movement Ooh. at all? Tell us, Lazy. I can't tell you because I never enjoyed that part of it. <laughs> I had nothing to do. We used to collect for the JNF and knock on doors that had Christmas trees. Uh -huh. Every year the JNF had a drive. Got a picture December. here. You talk about the Yiddish Folk Show. Here is a big picture talking about this. Is here we see uh, <clears throat> Dainy's father Tuchman, my dad who was the teacher. A uh, man by the name of uh, uh, Louis Perchanik uh, and uh, Mrs. Letwin, but they're lined up here. This was taken on a Sunday. Uh, there must be 75 kids here that happen to be here for this particular yeah, picture. Hall, and we're all, we're all in here. We're all in here. No, it's not at Rosa. It's in front of the folk show. Oh, it's in front of the folk show. But in regard to what you said, mm -hmm. I think it was in 1967 uh, when. Uh, the war in Israel, that the Milwaukee Jewish Federation realized what the people in the uh, labor Zionist movement could help with and could be part of. Because I remember my uncle and Mr. Spiegel, my father, they, they were very much a part of that. Up to that time, I don't think that we were really looked upon with much respect. I mean, we were a small group. But at that time, and also a lot of Reform Jews suddenly became Zionists. I mean, people came out of the woodwork uh, and were very, very ardent Zionists and were out there raising money, which they had never done before. Now, as a members of the labor Zionist movement, what kind of activities did you engage in? Let's let's talk about Habonim because that's the biggie. Uh, Paul, you were you were around when it became well, Habonim. Ben and I were the first leaders. Uh -huh. We were 13 and 14 years old, and we were leaders of a group that Esther was in, and we were about two Dorothy. years older than them. And Dorothy was in. We were two years older than, them, but we were their <laughs> leaders. And after a while, uh, okay. they got sick and tired of me, and I turned it over to Herman. I remember. <laughs> Herman left the city. <laughs> we went to ag school with the idea of going to Israel. But we, we had a strong Habonim organization. It was, it was Jewish, it was scouting, and uh, it had to do with camp. Yeah, and it had to do with the Camp Techai that we all went to. And it was the first time that kids learned how to live in tents and to make their own meals and to be on Avodah and do all this stuff in connection with the operation of a camp. But we had Bonim, Sofim, and, and Solalim. Solalim were the youngest, and then Sofim were the scouts, and the oldest ones were the Bonim, and that, that they got to be 17 or 18 or 19 years old. And the, the original leaders called the Rosh Machne was Isidore Sedlet, uh, Esther Heine, uh, Mignon, Mignon Weiss, who went to Israel, Menucha. Wasn't he known from 
she was a, Canada. She was a, she came to Milwaukee and she taught at the Emanuel Temple. Yes. Uh, who were some of the other Rosh? Well, your brother Al was the Rosh Machna at one time, right? Weren't you a Rosh Machna? I don't think so. No? What? Waxers, I mean. Waxer girls. The no, the, girls? neither of them were, were Rosh um, Machna. You were asking about numbers before. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if Havonim in its, in its heyday, as here locally, had more than 100 members. No, they had more than that. No, they didn't. They're still to. spread out. Right now, in, in, our organiz in, in our city, we, I see people that were in Habunim, they went away from it years ago. <laughs> we stuck with the organization. They went away from it years ago. But we touched an awful lot of young people that were in the Jewish uh, community at well, that they time. They came around there because they had fun. They did Israeli singing and dancing, and that was a big novelty at that time. And, uh, and we had it, you know, the, 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 uh, the floors would creak every Saturday night when the kids were dancing the horror and all those other songs all those other dances. It's probably important to say that Hashomer Atzair was also labor Zionist. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had uh, a different attitude toward uh, the establishment of the state. They, at that time, believed in a binational state. Right. Uh, and that was the basic difference, supposedly, between Hashomer Atzair and, and Habonim. But uh, at their height, uh, they had uh, probably as many kids in Hashomer as we had. No, they didn't. And, no, so well, no, I, I don't know, no. problematically, but... Uh, they were uh, much they, farther to the left, though. They were yeah. further to the they left, and, and they had more people who go to, that went to Israel from yeah, Milwaukee than, uh, than were, Milwaukee. But they were quite they, militant, yeah. Weren't they more affiliated with the communist no, movement no, rather no, than no, the socialist no, movement? No. <clears throat> no. Now, in terms of, uh, you, 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 you mentioned Tel Chai as a Jewish camp, and I, frankly, was never in Tel Chai. Oh, did you oh. miss it? Well, I missed it. Well, that's the whole point. So why didn't you? That's right. So, so what, about, what, what, what was distinctive about Tel Chai and the way it was operated, and what ever happened to, to, to Tel Chai? It's part of a I-94 in Illinois. <laughs> as, <or> Michigan, <laughs> as, Michigan, Michigan. Michigan. As we speak. It was a beautiful camp on Lake Michigan, about five miles away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know of any real good Habonim camp that has a real water. good water supply. <laughs> we used the nearby lake, which was a, a, a mile and a quarter from our campsite. Uh, those were those wonderful those summers. Were, yeah, those were wonderful. memorable but, days. But, but you know, one of the things you ought to say about camp is that because of camp, we met kids from all over the country, mm -hmm. uh, from other camps, <laughs> and we had uh, seminars in cities like St. Louis and Chicago, Milwaukee, Detroit, Detroit uh, Minneapolis, where, you know, kids who grew up the same way as we did with their parents coming over from Europe as labor Zionists, uh, we all became friends, and we're to really, many of us are friends today. Uh, and many of us married through yes, because of Yes, that is correct. That's also, right. You, for one. I, for one. Me, for one. Other. <laughs> I joined Pablo at age you 11. For Me, for one. At what? <laughs> From Chicago. <laughs> I joined Pablo Nim at age 11 in Chicago, and at that time we came to Camp Tel Chai. Camp Tel Chai was then being occupied by, um, as a camp, by Hashomer Hatzair out of Chicago. It was in 1934. I was yes. there. Yes. However, yes, however, the year after, uh, the uh, organization took it uh, took it back, and then I was a non-camp camper because we were in the hotel, hotel, and uh, <laughs> so we beat them in baseball and they retired. <laughs> so, so we played in baseball and so on, but. I think that was on or about the time that we started to have the seminars in Milwaukee uh, during Christmas uh, vacation in school. Now, one of those wonderful <coughs> seminars, I remember Golda Meyerson then came and danced with us and talked with us and so on. The mayor of Milwaukee came to address us and so on. And it was a wonderful, wonderful relationship that kept on growing and growing and growing. The relationship between the Chicago kids and from Camp Tel Chai and on uh, grew it very intensely to this very day. It still exists, and if I had to re relocate from Chicago, which wasn't police forced, I, I moved to Milwaukee. I think besides all these things, I think one really has to mention the fact that 
within this group of people, there was an intensity uh, that I don't think can be measured uh, in any other similar group, whether it be either religious or, or uh, political or anything else. I mean, these people and their children uh, were totally concerned with uh, Judaism, with the establishment of, of a state. Uh, they didn't all go to shul. They didn't all uh, uh, fast on Yom Kippur. Uh, they didn't all, although all of these things were accepted, uh, it was not illegal. But the intensity of this group, I don't think, uh, can be measured, and I don't think can be paralleled with any other group anywhere. Because uh, uh, nobody enjoyed the establishment of the State of Israel uh, on Independence Day like this group uh, enjoyed it. May I also say about Habonim <clears throat> that we really felt like we were the elite. We sort of looked down on other social ch uh, kids, you know, teenagers. Uh, organizations like BBYO and you know they were after all they didn't have serious reason for existing we had a serious ideal that we were working for so we were really special speaking of uh, Tel Chai this was one of eight or nine camps throughout the country in Canada that were Habonim sponsored camps and um, I think our first tuition was seven dollars a week, and most of us were on scholarships. Oh, yeah, they had scholarships <laughs> down to about three and a half. But uh, we, uh, the camp started fo actually folded because of lack of people back in 1942-43. I think 43 was the last year of camp, because the next year we could go to Commons, which uh, not Commons to. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, that's from Illinois. We went to Savannah in forty. Savannah was forty six. Forty five. But 46. they um, they managed to hold a camp open in Detroit. Yes, across from Farbant camp, from right? Camp. Right. Camp. Canary. Canary. It was Canary. 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 Yeah. And then after that, the history of it was that we built several camps here in Wisconsin, and it finally wound up well, how many years ago in uh, um, Three Rivers, Michigan. It's, uh, it just had an anniversary. Years, many, many years. Alex was 20 years one of, Alex was one of the, um, he, he ran the camp. No, he, he was, was roast by us up north. In, uh, so was I. At Wapaka. Oh. That was Yadari, the, the camp. Yeah. 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 The camp. Lazy and I were there this, that summer also. Yeah. And uh, cook. She was a cook. And I think I think Savannah burned, wasn't it? Burned? No, that was no, a, that Savannah. Was we rented, rented it. it. We rented, we rented it. it. Walked to the state of Illinois. Bumi was a driver. Yeah, yeah. it was a well, triple A. It was uh, it, not it triple. It was CCC. Driving. Was it a CCC? CCC I knew it, it was, was three on letters. The Mississippi yeah. River. <laughs> Could have been KKK, but it yeah. wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> you were a roast there one year. We were there for two years. Forty-five and forty-six. We came there from the and, well, and, then, and then, then we had the war, and that's when the next stage of our development, as far as organizations were concerned, where we all got involved with the Brandeis branch of the Labor oh, yeah. Zionist yeah. organization, yeah. which started in 1946 when we got out of the service. Oh, that's leaders. when it. That's when it started. And uh, I've got something interesting that I brought here, and I don't know if you were aware of it. Back in in that time, 46, 47, 48. Before the establishment of the State of Israel, the Brandeis branch had a weekly Sunday morning program where we dramatized yeah. the news. And I've got the scripts here. I, I grabbed them today. And we'll look when we'll have a little more time. I'll show you this stuff where Max Lichter was, a, was an announcer. And they were written by Edith Nelson and Sally Eisenberg. Uh, the famous uh, Alan Eisenberg's mother was uh, uh, on the script, <laughs> in the script oh, there. Uh, uh, Esther, yeah. you, you had a part in one of these, I remember. WEMP. Uh, WEMP. And, uh, and there are some very significant scripts here in connection with uh, what was going on at that time in the Yiddish, and the Yiddish street and in the Yiddish world and in the Arab world. And uh, this is really historic stuff. Exactly. One of these right. days, we should turn it over to uh, the, the archives. archives. <laughs> was that in direct competition with uh, Zibelman? Didn't he have his? I think it was at a different time. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean the same years. Well, he was. Well, 
a different level. Well, well, well we also spoke English. Was it English commercial? Oh, that'd be interesting. Wasn't the Yiddish? It was. It wasn't. When, when was did I, the first? Uh, when did I ever leave for Palestine? Then. Uh, uh, Al, right? yeah. His twin yeah. brother. Did you born in Al? Yeah, Al left in '49. Uh, Legally. He Earlier than legally, no, 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 right? No, no, no. Well, he was he not. Went, 44. He left in forty-five. 44. A year before we were married, Blossom was still here. Oh, yes. oh, I was yeah. married he in was forty-six, and Blossom was here. He left on an illegal ship right? that brought right. refugees into Israel. Israel. I think they were married in forty-four, right. and he left in forty-five. Oh, I was discharged from the army, and then all these khaki towels that we had to turn back. I took a whole bundle of them to the Chava where my sister was at the time, and Blossom gave me a pair of shoes that she was going to send to Alvin and wanted to bet, get them to be a little scuffed and worn so that they don't, so they can go through customs. That's Blossom. So, and incidentally, Al's shoe size, I've got to admit, was a little too small for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I broke them in fast. Tell us, say what the Chava was. Well, the Chava was a training camp to go to Palestine. And uh, Red can tell you better because years. she was there for three years. It was in New Jersey. It was uh, in New Jersey. Cream Ridge, New Jersey. She was a yeah. slow trainer. <laughs> <laughs> Cream Ridge was a town of like uh, two people, two, two families and a store. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, post office between Allentown and Yardville. Or not Dan. far, <laughs> not far from Trenton. It was a, a farm that was set up in the 30s for people who were planning on going to Palestine as halutzim, as people who would work the land, as you talked about. Pioneers. Pioneers. And uh, I was there for three years because I came in 43 during the war, and nobody could leave for Israel then, for Palestine then. And I was there because I'm from St. Louis originally, but my family were one of the few that I ever knew of who most people said when their kids said, I want to go to Palestine, no, that's enough. However active they were in Habunim, my parents said, go, because they went. <laughs> that's why you're here. That's why I'm in Milwaukee. Well, you got to tell Chai from St. Louis at that time, because kids from St. Louis. My mother was the Hebrew teacher in Tel Chai that summer. And I never went to any kind of Hebrew school or Yiddish school or anything like that, because I learned Hebrew at home. I mean, she was a, a teacher. You and your twin brother were there, I remember. Yes. yes. That first summer, my sister also was there. She was six. Six? Well, because my mother was there. <laughs> it was called Free <laughs> <laughs> no, But it, it was, it was, that was what the Chaba was. And Heightstown, uh, Heights New Jersey, had a Chaba for Hashomer Hatzair yeah. at the same time. I've got some historical stuff here. I've got here uh, a little booklet of minutes of the Brandeis meeting from back in 48 and 49, signed by Golda Sozov, Miriam Orenstein, Secretary Leah Knaz, Ethel Sedlet, uh, uh, Julia Rabinowitz, with the dues, the re record of dues and everything else, Do Doris, uh, Doris Carmen, and... I don't, re well, I, I'm not going to go look through this, but I'll just read from a paragraph here. This is a meeting, there's a board meeting on February 9th, 1949. Herman Weingrad then reported on a Purim social, which is to be held March 19th at the Jewish Center, proceeds of which are to go for the group's JNF quota. This, this is the kind of stuff that's in here. You've got to take a look at this because it's, it's fascinating. The JNF quota? The JNF quota. We had to bring in so much money for JNF. And the, and the name of this little book, it, it, booklet is Precious Seconds from the Minutes. Oh, that's lovely. Oh. By Paul Melrose. <laughs> I wonder why you read it. In, in, ter in terms of Hakshara, though, why, why don't we go into that? Because there was an orientation, we, we didn't hit on it, we hit on to, uh, to, to, to some extent, there was an orientation in terms of Aliyah. Yes, and, absolutely. And so, and so labor Zionism also included the, the uh, there's an underlying thrust of the, of, of the group to, to, to go to Palestine and settle the land. <clears throat> and that, I, would, I, I know, occurred here in Milwaukee with, with the people, obviously, Golda went, but there were also many people who went, and they went through the Hakshara camp in New Jersey, and they established, I would think, 
Garidim, which was self-contained groups, to go on to a kibbutz uh, and then establish the kibbutz within this group called the Garin. And uh, uh, to people... Yeah, part of the Achalutz movement, which I think we talked about. Right. Uh, well, in connection with that, at yeah. these seminars that we used to have, especially during the, the holidays uh, before the end of the year between Chicago and Milwaukee, there used to be special sessions there that were run by Hechalutz, people who belonged to Hechalutz at that time, and they said that they're going to Israel. I know that there were more kids from Chicago that were involved with the Hechalutz because a lot more went from Chicago than went from Milwaukee. The first uh, uh, kibbutz that the uh, Americans majority were involved in is Kfar Blum. Yeah. And uh, that was, uh, I think, established around 1942, if I remember correctly. But the first people who went to, to Kfar Blum was just before or just during the war. Just before. Uh, and, uh, and, and, huh? They were mostly oh, Americans? Not, not then, no. Not then, no, it was later. Because no, the Americans came in 39. Before they uh, closed the, original the doors. The ones were Latvians. Right. Well, I'm not talking about the original, but I'm saying well, that the biggest, that. No, the biggest group Africa. of, of uh, people from Habonim uh, Sonia and, and Joey Cried all and went and to Kvar Blum. That was, that's, where they, that's where they that's where they went. Field, Sasson, yeah. Paulie Milgram. Yeah. Inter, 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 interestingly enough, Paul Milgram, uh, who came from Chicago, wrote into my in my autograph book. And he spelled Ale of Ne wrong. And here's a guy who went to Israel and he didn't spell it right in Hebrew, and I've still got that autograph book. And he was one of the big leaders. Why, we may not have gone there, but our kids went there. So yes, our right. kids live there. So Bumi has a son there, we yeah. have a daughter there. We have a daughter there. You, Diny had kids there. You have a, you have a younger there. brother oh, there. Of course. Right. We all have right. Right. Both we all brothers. Have right. Except but I think you want to say something about, you know, the Hechelotz movement. The, these were the pioneers. And, I mean, it was, and they were the one, I mean, they went to settle on the land, which was part of the theory or the, of labor Zionism. And so they had to know about l agriculture. And none of us grew up on farms. And none of us knew anything about agriculture. So many of them went to university. Some went to the Hechelotz, some went to the university. Uh, to study agriculture. I was in, uh, at the University of Illinois. There were five or six of us there. Uh, except for me, they were all studying some phase of agriculture. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you were part of that. You were studying diamond. You were studying diamond. Diamond? <laughs> I was studying diamond. <laughs> well, you wanted to be a veterinarian, First of all, I didn't study. <laughs> you, didn't you want to be a veterinarian at that time? No, not at that and time. You couldn't stand cats? <laughs> Interestingly enough, one of the first of the Habonim, really, that went to Palestine, in the early days, this is when, when the Italian Air Force was bombing in Ethiopia. They also sent a flight over to Palestine, and one of our Haverim was killed with a bombing thing in Palestine. Haver Locks from Chicago, who was an organizer, he had a son who was uh, is that killed. There? No? no, not Mitch Lawrence. Sereni? No, Ansa Sereni was somebody else. He came to he Chicago to visit. Ansa Sereni was, was one of our organizers uh, before the war. His father was the physician to, to King, King Victor King. Emmanuel. And Sereni was here, and he was with us at Tel Chai. Hi. And he, we wanted to play baseball, and he used to say, Aznu, you want to play belly ball, or you want to hear about Palestine? <laughs> What happened to Enzo Sereni so people would know about him? He was, Enzo, he was dropped be behind the enemy lines to work, to work there, and uh, he was shot. He was caught there and shot. And this is the son of the uh, doctor to King Victor Emmanuel. He didn't really have to do that, and uh, he was that gung-ho. But he spent time with us at, in <coughs> Camp, Camp Tel Chai, Enzo Sereni. Right. And, you know, to get back to Habonim, uh, we, our meetings consisted of, of learning things. I mean, we really were very serious at these, other than having fun, of course, 
we also had session. Sicha. Sicha. Sichot. Sichot. And they were really very inspiring, I think, we felt, most well, of us. One of the most unique things about how many that I, can, that I can recall is the fact that the leadership was provided within the group. Right. And that we didn't have adult advisors in which you have, you know, you have all the groups had them. And we kind of set ourselves apart from some of the other youth groups because it was all self-led. Like B'nai B'rith and others, they had the senior uh, advisors, yeah. yeah. they always had yeah. yeah. Right. No, you're right. One of the things also, just all of a sudden, forget about that <clears throat> part of the Habunim, the war really killed it, World War II. I mean, people were drafted into the Army, people were drafted into the Navy, or whatever the case may be, and you lost that whole generation Some of people. Some volunteered even. Huh? Some people even volunteered. Yeah, here we are. We <laughs> volunteered. But the interesting thing was, <clears throat> in order to keep that thing alive and pumping, they had a Habonim Institute yes. that Bumi was at for, was it two years in well, New York? A year. In Chai. Chai, uh, yeah. Time's wife went there the first year it right. was in existence, I was there that was the second year. 44, 45. With your sister-in-law. Oh, yeah, Bella. that's Bella. right. Mm -hmm. And they kept it going. It was a very active part. You studied in New York for nine months or ten months. Yeah. And then you had, uh, and then you had a year of service. service someplace. And what happened was that was a forerunner of the Habonim uh, workshop. 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 In other words, people graduating <clears throat> high school, all our kids went. Um, um, Israel. Yeah, I know they went to Israel. No, I was, went. Oh, they went. <laughs> I didn't know what the next word is. Oh. Uh, the thing is, is that they, that became the basis of uh, sending your children to Israel working on a kibbutz, studying the and workshop. working the workshop. a workshop. Right. What year did and the workshop start? 48, maybe? 49 about in Israel? 48 or 49, yeah. That's uh, so still going on today. But the institute yeah. only lasted, I think, two years. Two years, years. right. 44 and 45. But it started. That's when it started. Yeah. It had a, you, then you had to work at, a, at the camps. Yeah. And I don't mean the camps. Then, the Hamonim camps here yeah. in the States. Yeah. That was your payback. And they still have workshops going yeah. to Israel? Yeah. 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 How many years is that that they've been going on? I know my lorry went, went to the second or third workshop yeah. with the Slamowitz girls. Maybe. I see. Away from Habunim over here, there's also pioneer women. So I know that uh, that there's that you know that that's certainly a different aspect of labor Zionism, a different aspect of the movement. So why don't you, those oh, who are active here? Can we walk around in the meantime? <laughs> <laughs> well, your mother was a case. Well, my mother, I think, was the first consul president. president right. Either the, she uh, or Rose Bukowski. No, I don't no, remember no, one of them. Bell, Bell was, was first. Yeah, uh, so. For those who are active, come on, Red. Well, come I'm on. not in Milwaukee, and let the Milwaukee. I mean, okay. the native Milwaukee. Okay. Well, then you talk about pioneer women in, in uh, well, I, what, that, what was that? What was that all about? Pioneer, pioneer women was all about uh, a relationship of women in the United States to women in Israel. Well, it's at Hapolot, which is, I think, even today the largest women's organization in Israel, and basically. What Pioneer Women did was it was a fundraising organization as well as an educational one in which we related to women and children in Israel. We took on projects, daycare, pro uh, daycare and uh, adoptions and all kinds of things involving children became our, our major interest. And uh, actually the group developed uh, during the war, during World War II. I mean, my mother was a member, but she was not an active member. Herman's mother was a very, very active member in, in Pioneer Women. But younger women became involved during the war because their husbands were overseas, and that's when a group of younger women started becoming involved in caring, and more of us then got interested. But I remember that my tante was a very, very busy pianerka, like my father used to call her. Uh, she was really, I think, the backbone of the organization, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she was never home. She was a little lady, but she was tough. <laughs> Jerry, this also was yeah. part of 
you said, or somebody here said that we were born into labor Zionism. Many of us, I think, were born into pioneer women as well. I know my, I, I'm from St. Louis. My mother was very active in pioneer <coughs> women there. And many of the women that I first met had backgrounds where their mothers also were active in pioneer women. There was also a David Pinsky Women's Club. Ladies Club, yeah. Uh, the the club was uh, Pinsky. Pinsky. <laughs> that was not the... Yeah, it was they, they, were, sure they were Farbante. Yeah. Yeah. It's it 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 the women's yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the Farbante became more uh, Zionist after they grew up than when they started out being uh, sort of a fraternal organization where you had a, uh, a policy to pay in case you died, you know, an insurance policy. Well, That's many what they. Women joined uh, Pioneer Women without realizing the political. Uh, affiliation. The labor Zionist part of the organization got kind of hidden and we, truthfully, we didn't, we didn't really push didn't the labor Zionists because we wanted women to be part of this organization and most of them really had no political affiliation with Israel, nor did they care. They just knew that there was a country there and it was ours and their children and they need help, and so they helped raise money. Basically a fundraising organization. In this country. Right. In this, in, in, in this country. Not in Israel. <clears throat> no, not in Israel. Uh, what about um, moving, moving uh, just a bit over here, uh, how did this translate in terms of your own children? How did, how did this work out with them? In terms of, here you have your background, you grew up in the labor Zionist movement, uh, and you became labor Zionist, you might say, right from the womb. But now you have your children. How, how, how did all this evolve with, with them? Well, I have two daughters that still go to reunions of the Habonim and of the camps that they were involved with to this day, to this year. They still come from all different parts of the country. They met this last year, I think, in Michigan, and both Laurie and Elise were there, and they, they have a similar relationship. It's amazing that they've got these friends from all over the country that were in the same uh, camp with them years and years ago. And I'm sure that the same is true with the rest of them. Our well, kids I, were in camp and ended up with one daughter being uh, going to Israel, making Aliyah. Uh, I have a granddaughter who is now going to Habonim camp, she has gone through her second summer there and loves it. Uh, so it, with some of us, it has continued on. Well, our kids are all friends, I think. Those who know one another yeah. are all friends, close friends. <coughs> um, I have a son in Israel. And, um, you know, the kids are still, they know what they are. It depends on many factors. I mean, yeah. not, our kids are ever involved. That's one of my great sorrows. <laughs> Our four sons never wanted to be involved in Habonim. And, uh, Did you ever have that analyzed? <laughs> I think, was that rejection? I don't know. Don't say that. Well, our daughter is in, from Habonim also, and she's now in Israel with three children, and uh, she's doing a wonderful job, and. We love it. We love to visit her. And she has contact with some friends of ours, and she has a wide range of friends in Israel. And it's, uh, she's living a good life under the circumstances that we now, ex that now exist. And uh, God willing, it'll be better. Was, no, she, yes, she did. Initially, she went to Keturah. And uh, she was just there briefly, and she was at another one up, up north, where basically she learned her Hebrew. And uh, befriended a Bedouin girl who was her closest friend until she moved to the big city of Jerusalem and uh, started to do what she's doing. And uh, we're very proud of her, and uh, we're in constant contact. And her biggest worry is how we are. <laughs> no. yeah. You mentioned uh, uh, the kibbutz. Uh, I'm just thinking one of the first ones to go of uh, the older generation was Jack 
Mervis and his wife, who was the director mm -hmm. of the Jewish Center here. He went to Urim. And, and he's so been there. Is he still living? He's still living. I know he's still living. He's got 101, I think. 101? Yes. Yes. 102, yeah. And when we saw him, oh, a, a, a few years ago, erect, working, standing, absolutely marvelous. No, not at all. Oh, well, see, that's no, the last time we saw him. No, he was. No, up till 98, he was standing <laughs> strong. <laughs> what about present involvement? Uh, I, uh, I know that everybody here is our, our, our friends and, and, and there's a very nice, wonderful relationship that you have with each other. But in terms of involvement with the Jewish community or, or involvement with the labor Zionist community that you once had, where, where is that now? It's, or I, uh, Talk about that. They're doing more in Chicago and Detroit than they're doing here in Milwaukee. Unfortunately, well, our group um, Gave up the ghost. <laughs> I don't know. The women are not mad though. Our brand. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but the women are active in Nama. The only Zionist group I belong to now is Nama. I get the magazines. That's right. That's our activity. I think that everybody here has been active in some form in the Jewish community here in Milwaukee. Uh, percentage wise, I would guess if you. Uh, if there were 50 of us who were involved uh, with parents who were labor Zionists, then 49 are probably uh, have uh, uh, exerted some influence either on an educational level, on a federation level, on a political level, uh, JNF, uh, whatever. Um, and uh, I, I think that we don't have to take a back seat to anybody <coughs> as far as our total contribution to the Jewish community of this of uh, the city of Milwaukee. You know, we even belong to Brindwood Country Club, I heard. That's probably and so. The, and I think, I mean, all of us have been active pretty much in Federation, too. Right. Uh, being part of the Jewish community. Jewish Community Center. Jewish community Center. Well, I think yeah. the yeah. name, uh, one time. the name Gold of My Ear has made uh, a difference as far as where Milwaukee is on the map as far as we're even nationally. Anytime anybody comes to Milwaukee, they, they call either Diney or Herman or me, you know, they want to talk about Golden Meyer, what, what information, what pictures, they want to go to the Golden Meyer Library. I think it, her living here and being part of the community, even though it was for a short time, uh, really made a difference in how we're uh, seen in the community. That's interesting. Sylvia was with the Journal Sentinel at the time that Golda was just become, had just become uh, prime minister. Yeah. And she went to the first press conference that she had given to the international press. And uh, she was scrounging around for what to say, what, to, what question to ask to get some kind of quote from her, so she yelled out, Milwaukee, Milwaukee, and she yelled, what did she say to you, honey? <laughs> what was that she said? How are, how are my friends? How are my friends in Milwaukee? <laughs> and that was her, was that? her Who quote. remembers the last time she was here? I remember she was here in 1963. 67. Was it 67? Mm -hmm. When she was given a, a doctorate, uh, honorary doctorate at the at UWM, she was a distinguished alumnus at that than time. Okay. Now, I remember I drove her uh, from from UWM to uh, our house on Sherman yeah, Boulevard she, for she uh, Onik Shabbat uh, after she had her Onik Shabbat at yeah. the university. Even with her two-year uh, diploma. Well, that was a diploma. Actually, you know, my mother and I got to visit her when she was prime minister at her home. Yeah. They were talking about migraine headaches. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy, you also. Well, you you and Kai. We did also. Carl so what a great cook she was. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best that story. Was, she wasn't cooking. No, oh, well. She was a hostess. She, I know, but she may, got messed That's up. That's one of the funniest stories we ever heard. Which was what? My kids were, were, were probably, uh, I think Jeremy must have been five and Shiloh must have been nine, and we went to Israel for uh, a short stay, and we were in Netanya where we liked to stay at that time, and 
whenever we went to Israel, we would call Golda Meir, whatever her station was. Uh, at one time, she was ambassador to Russia. And uh, the last time, though, was she was already the prime minister. And uh, I called, and I got her secretary, and I told the, the secretary who I was and uh, that I would like to talk with Golda, and if she has a minute, or anyway, she called back. And she invited us to come on a Saturday afternoon on Shabbat for a Hanukkah party at the, uh, at the prime minister's mansion in Jerusalem. <laughs> so uh, we were kind of excited about it. I don't know if my kids knew how to be excited about something like that or not, but we were. And uh, we left the early Saturday morning and, and uh, drove to Jerusalem. We got to the uh, mansion, and uh, there was a gendarme who was kind of half asleep in the little uh, uh, box outside the, the door. And we told him who we were, and she invited us in, and, and everybody hugged and kissed and stuff like that. And she said she really tried to call the party off because this was uh, the time of uh, the uh, uh, Russian uh, problem relative to the uh, dissidents and stuff like that. And she was supposed to invite 40 Russians, and they couldn't come. So she called the party off. So there was a big, long table like here to the next room. And uh, it was all lovely white, and uh, uh, this is where the party was supposed to be. But then she said that she was supposed to be picked up by Moshe Dayan, and she had to go to a mass meeting in Tel Aviv uh, uh, talking to the Russians, let my people go. So uh, uh, we understood that she couldn't spend much time with us. But like in Israel, everybody, no matter how much time there is or how much time there isn't, you have to have a cup of coffee. So she had a, a, a Yemenite girl that she called in the kitchen and uh, put up coffee, and the kids had Coke or soda of some kind, and Chai and I had coffee. She wanted to know how we liked our coffee, and we said uh, black with sugar. So fine, there was sugar, and there was coffee, and there were some cookies, and I put the, some sugar in my coffee, and Chai did the same thing. I took one drink, and my eyes rolled back. This wasn't sugar, it was salt. <laughs> and it, it was, you know, now, Chai looked at me and I looked at her. What do you do with a, with a prime minister to tell her that somebody sabotaged her sugar bowl? I mean, you know, so we kept our mouth shut. We didn't say anything. We took a couple sips. She had a run, and we said goodbye. Two years later, she uh, was in Chicago for a... Uh, a meeting of some kind of bond, yeah. huh? bond. bond Israel bond, at the Palmer House. And uh, Dorothy and Chai and my daughter Shyla and my aunt uh, and, 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 huh? Emma. Emma. My mother and my aunt, Mrs. Weingrad, drove to, to uh, Chicago. And uh, we caught her eye uh, before she, she started her speech. And she said, you know, she pointed when we come up, that we should go upstairs after because she wanted to talk with us. So she finished her speech and everybody clapped and we went upstairs to her private uh, suite up there. And there were a couple of gendarmes there that were watching things. We had to uh, convince them that we were honored guests. We walked in and she walked into the room and she looked at me and she said, Chaim, why didn't you tell me that there was salt in that sugar bowl. <laughs> now, this is two years later, and completely, you know, with all the problems that she had in the world, and, and, and with Israel, and with Russia, and with Jews all over, she had to remember that that sugar bowl was sabotaged. I think now we're going to kind of wind things up after that story by, by, uh, by Diney. Uh, what I forgot to do at the beginning was ask uh, 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 for everybody's permission to uh, uh, have this taped and uh, shown. So unless there's any uh, dissent to that, I take it that everybody agrees. Aye, right. Aye, aye. 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 Okay. Sure. Uh, to wind things up, I think um, uh, we'd, li we'd like to get your views or your thoughts about what um, what bodes for the future and what kind of a message you might want to give to people who will see this tape uh, in, in years to come. So we can kind of go around the table or you can uh, jump in when you, when you have something to say, but I think we can um, wind it up in that fashion. So who wants to? I'll start. I think go ahead, that, uh, 
It's, uh, it remains very important for all of us by our being here tonight and uh, speaking a little bit about this, that uh, uh, the state of Israel is really a very important part of our lives and it will continue to be for as long as we live. We would certainly like to see a happier, healthier situation in the Middle East than what we see now. And we would certainly hope that uh, uh, there will be a good result from communication with the Arabs and uh, that some way or other, uh, some kind of a peace uh, modem can be established. I think I, for myself, uh, you know, I, I read the newspaper, I listen to the uh, television, and uh, I get the New York Times, and I get the Milwaukee Journal, and the Chicago Tribune, and the, the, after scanning the headlines, the next thing I look for is uh, what's the news from Israel, and, and, and I then look at the uh, uh, editorial page to see what their comments are relative to what's going on. So I think that, that uh, uh, as far as my upbringing and my uh, concern and my knowledge and my desire, I certainly feel that uh, that all of us here uh, communicating with you have the same intensity and spirit and hope for a better world and a better Israel. I don't know how else to say well, it. I, I would say that I agree with everything that Diney said and I want to add a different dimension to it. I feel that because of the way we grew up and where we grew up uh, and the time we grew up, we've lived a much richer life because of our Jewish identification. That this gets back to something that Esther said before about we really had the best of all the worlds besides the fact living in Milwaukee and the United States and being good American citizens we also had this richness of the Jewish culture and uh, the, the, the politics that has been involved and the uh, relationship to this, the growth of the state of Israel so we've lived a Jewish life and a full Jewish life with a very very multicolored uh, kind of uh, uh, a hue that really gave us a, a high quality uh, form of, of life that has made it much richer than uh, somebody else who wasn't grown up in Milwaukee with the Jewish background that we've had. I, I think the message should be, could be the importance of education, of Jewish education, of learning who we are and what our roots were and what we tried to do in our lifetime and that you can't really do any of these things unless you understand and know from where you come and from where your parents and your grandparents, which is who we are now and how important it is to know and to understand. and. and